remember uh, what the covenant of redemption is? Does anyone remember what we talked about from the main thing from last week? What is the covenant of redemption? What was I getting at in discussing God as the first or primary or ultimate evangelist? Does anybody remember at all? Yeah, Jim? Absolutely, yeah, thank you. So is the eternal, so we're thinking eternity past, hard for our finite minds to grasp that concept, but eternity past, intra, I-N-T-R-A, intra, Trinitarian, which means within the members of the Godhead. How many gods are there? One on one, two living God. How many persons are in the Godhead? Three. Three. Who are the three persons? Uh, Father, 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 One God, same substance, right, equal in power and glory. So there's one God, three persons within the Godhead. So we're talking the eternal covenant, agreement, purpose, pact, different words, kind of convey the same idea. Uh, between the Father and the Son, especially, you don't want to forget the Spirit at all, but we're thinking more of the Father and the Son, um, uh, to redeem a people, to save a people in time. That's what we mean, God's original plan to save sinners, covenant of redemption. And we looked at several scriptures from which we infer this teaching, uh, John 17, 4, for example, where Jesus says, I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So there Jesus speaks of a work, a task, that was given to him. And that task was to humble himself and to take on a human nature and to live and die and rise again uh, for the gospel. Uh, Luke 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek and save for the law. Galatians 4.4 4 says, when the fullness of time had come, God, in, contra- in context, the Father, sent his Son. Galatians 1.4, Jesus says that he, um, uh, the, 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 he delivered himself, that Jesus uh, gave himself for our sins. On the one hand, the Father sent the Son. On the other hand, Jesus humbled himself gave himself uh, to die for sinners. That is the very heart of the gospel. Uh, then John 3.16 we looked at, and we called the heart, uh, or the, the, the gospel behind the gospel. And that is God's uh, incomprehensible uh, love for this sinful world. For God so loved this world and all of its rebellion and enmity against him uh, to such an extent that he would send his son, with whom Think of it this way, it makes it even more amazing that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit for eternity past, again, it's hard to even think of those concepts, for eternity past had enjoyed perfect, they weren't lacking anything, there weren't any need, uh, they enjoyed perfect fellowship forever, eternity past, but to save you and me, the Father agreed and appointed the Son to humble himself to die, to, to, to have that fellowship broken for an inextricable moment on the cross. That, as we talked about last week, the very heart and core of uh, God's purpose in saving sinners. Okay, today we're going to uh, advance the discussion uh, a little bit. Think about election and evangelism. Now, this is not so much a lesson on election. We're not going to deal with all the objections with election and Look at all the scriptures and the verses. We're kind of just going to assert the doctrine and state it. Uh, we're a Reformed church. We stand in the uh, heritage of the Reformation and in the heritage of the entire church, more or less, from Abraham and asserting God's sovereignty in salvation. So we're not going to deal with all the objections. If you want to talk about them, we can do that after class. Um, but we're going to think about how does our understanding of election comport with, or how is it consistent with, our desire to take the gospel and share it with others? Aren't those contradictory? The answer is no, um, but they might appear to be at first. And so that's that's where we're going. Um, so secondly, second question, what is the doctrine of election? So anybody, what's, what's the doctrine of election? 
in one sentence, you might summarize the doctrine of elect. Yeah, Carla? God's Yeah, very good. So God, again, from all eternity, elected some, chose some, appointed some to eternal life. Uh, God's sovereign choice. God's sovereign choice uh, to, to redeem out of the mass of sinful humanity, to redeem and to save some, and in so doing, to pass by others. Or the doctrine of election. God's sovereign choice. That's how Arthur Sproul would often describe it. Um, now, let's think of another angle on the doctrine of election is this, that we can connect it to, um, I think Larry hit on this just a, a moment ago, the, to the, the covenant of redemption. But hang with me, you know, all these kind of big concepts. The, the, in eternity past, the Father gave the Son a people. Another way to think of it. That in eternity past, the Father gave his Son a bride. So he gave a defined set of people a bride. And it is that bride for which Christ died on the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, he was dying for his bride. Um, he, he died with specific names on his heart and in his mind. The names of his bride, the names of those whom the Father had given him from eternity past. Another kind of way to think about the doctrine of election. The ones that, that God chose, he chose and gave them as a people to his son to be a bride, to be purchased and saved in time through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, this language of God giving a people to his son, we're not just pulling that out of thin air. Uh, we find it in the Bible, especially in the Gospel of John. We find it all over the Gospel of John. So let's look at a few of these verses which speak of the Father giving a people to his Son. So open up to John 17. It occurs several times in John 17. So I'm going to read from John 6 real quick, uh, and then we'll turn over to John 17. John chapter 6, verse 37. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Let's think about that for just a moment. All that the Father gives me, and all whom the Father gave to me, they all will come to me. That is in God's providence, in God's sovereign timing, all of those that from eternity past, the Father gave to his Son, they will come to me. Jesus doesn't say they might come, I hope they come, uh, and I hope we can convince them to come. No, all that the Father gave me will come to me. Everybody kind of see the, the weight of that statement. And we'll come back to that under question, under question three. So just grasp that uh, for now. Now we'll skip over to John 17 and just is all over this high priestly prayer we looked at last week a little bit in which we are eavesdropping in a sense on the, the son's prayer to the father so let's look at a couple verses from here from john 17. um the first few verses it says when jesus had spoken these words he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said father the hour has come glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So let's see that. To give eternal life to who? To those whom you have given me, Jesus is saying. Uh, then look at verse, um, verse 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. There is a people the Father gave to the Son out of the out of the world, out of sinful humanity. Verse 9. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Um, verse 24 says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. So you get the drift. Uh, this is a constant theme, especially in John, those the Father gave to 
Verse 25, Jesus, this is a, a great good shepherd discourse. Uh, I told, verse 25, Jesus answered, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Let that sink in for just a moment. You do not believe because you are not of my sheep. That is, you are not of those of whom the Father gave me from eternity past. It doesn't say, it doesn't say, you're not my sheep because you don't believe. It says, you are not my sheep, therefore you do not believe. There's a world of difference in that little distinction. Verse 26, um, again, you do not believe because, you do not believe because you are not of uh, my sheep. Now you might be thinking, well, why do we, so we don't know who God's sheep are. We, we can't read people's minds. We can't read people's hearts. Hang with me until question number three. So we're going to get there in just in just a second. Um, look at John 10, um, verse 14 through 16. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I have other sheep. In context, we're talking about the Gentile sheep. I have Gentile sheep who perhaps have never even heard the gospel, likely hadn't even heard the gospel about at this point in Jesus' ministry, but Jesus says, they are my sheep, whom the Father gave me in, you know, uh, uh, before the foundation of the world, which is implied. Nobody, nobody get that. Nobody get that. I have other sheep who are not of Israel. The gospel hasn't yet exploded over the, the boundaries of Israel. That's, that's the book of Acts. That's the missionary impulse of the church, but just listen to those verses that we read all the time and let, let that weight sink in. Uh, a couple other verses, just on the doctrine of election, the, the more classic ones, Ephesians 1.4, because God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, another classic proof text. Um, Romans 9, if you're going to look at Romans 9. Um, Acts 13.48, we'll look at one more. Acts 13.48, where you see how often the Bible talks about God's sovereignty, that he had, the Father gave a people to his son. He gave a flock to his son. He gave a bride to his son in eternity past. Um, John, uh, Acts, 8, Acts 13, excuse me, verse 48. This is Paul's first great sermon uh, in his his ministry. Acts 13, 48 says, listen very closely, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. When they heard the gospel, when they heard Paul's preaching, when they heard the gospel. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. The Bible see that. Who were the ones who believed? As many as were appointed to eternal life. Those that were appointed to eternal life and eternity past, those the same ones the Father gave to His Son, the same ones uh, that the Father chose, that God chose for the foundation of the world, the doctrine of election. Uh, nobody, nobody get that. We see it all the way. We can go all the way to the Old Testament. We see God choosing Israel. Why did God choose Israel? Nothing inherent to Israel, because He did. Because it was His sovereign purpose to choose uh, Israel. This this teaching of God's sovereignty, his sovereign grace in salvation is woven throughout every page of your Bible. That brings us to the question we really want to think about and just and camp out for the rest of our time, more or less, questions three and four. Questions three and four. How do we reconcile the doctrine of election with evangelism? We are called to evangelize. Uh, we are called to sow the seed of the gospel. We, we believe in evangelism. We just had vacation Bible school last week, and we presented the gospel to every child there. We don't know that the hearts of those children. Uh, we don't know if those children were those who were appointed to eternal life before the foundation of the world. God knows that. But 
We're going to sow the seed of the gospel to as many children as we can last, last week. That's why we put a lot of time in for things like that. That's why some of our youth are going to do some evangelism, actually on the ground evangelism, in, in the streets of Dayton later this summer. We believe in it. Um, it's part of our Reformation heritage. But how do we reconcile this? You, may, you can probably see how some have taken this to an unbiblical extreme and will say, we don't need to do evangelism. Uh, we just wait until God brings them, and then we'll disciple them. It's called hyper-Calvinism. Not us. We, that's not us at all. That's not the tradition in which we stand, the glorious reform tradition. Uh, John Calvin, one of our heroes, passionate about evangelism and training ministers, sending them all the way to Brazil. That's those who've never heard the gospel. Jonathan Edwards, another one of our great Calvinist heroes, went to evangelize I think, the Native Americans in Connecticut uh, in the 18th century. We could go on and on and on and on. Um, but how do we reconcile these, these two ideas? Let me just talk, I have some answers and verses we're going to look at, but let's just kind of get the juices flowing. Any thoughts? If someone says, if your neighbor uh, maybe um, doesn't hold to reformed theology, says, you know, why do you do evangelism if you believe in election? What, how about, what do we say? Yes, Brad? God's chosen to work through means, and typically that is in person communicating the gospel to others. Very good. And the Holy Spirit regenerates them and gives them faith in Christ. Absolutely. That was the first point. Yeah, very good. So God has chosen to work through means. God ordains the ends E-N-D-S, that is the goal that he will accomplish in his sovereignty, but he also ordains the means to that end. Now, the very days of your life are numbered, that we still have to breathe. If we don't breathe, we die. That's the means to the end of, the num- of your days, and the Lord has numbered all of our days. Um, but there's means to preserving, and to preserving life. The Lord works through means, M-E-A-N-S, uh, instruments, uh, to accomplish his his purpose. What else? Yeah, Robert. Very good. Yeah, the Bible says so. So we can just stop there and pack up and go home. Um, and we're actually going to look at a lot of places where the Bible says, you know, that's, and we're, in a sense, we will arrest it. Uh, in a sense, there is a certain mystery um, in a, that we, we're not being finite hard for us to reconcile, so in a sense we will simply plant our flag in what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches X and Y. The Bible teaches election and it teaches uh, a zeal for evangelism. Um, and we, we rest. We, you know, we, that's what faith is. Resting in God's word wherever it leads us. Um, but how about any other answers we could give? Yeah, uh, Matt and then Scott. It's kind of, I mean, it's a way to understand God's sovereignty. Mm-hmm. More than likely they'll have a sense similar to his free will Either we're robots yep. or we get to determine everything within them. God will and our will and they, they don't make sense to us. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. Let me just emphasize that that um, thinking through election and evangelism is one of several examples of thinking through the broader topic of God's sovereignty and our responsibilities. You got the same question, why pray? Uh, one of my professors in seminary uh, wrote a great book on prayer entitled If God Already Knows Why I Pray. So there's the same, uh, you can, we're commanded to. Right? Just close our end of discussion. But so we, can, we can do more, the Bible does this more. Um, so we want to dig a little deeper. But it's a species of the overarching issue that it's good for us to think through. God is sovereign, clearly. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God, not man, yet we are called to do things in our various lives. Pray, live a Christian life, evangelize, etc. So yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, Matt, Scott, do you have a thought? Uh, you, you said it yourself. Um, in, and you're quoting from John 6. The, all, that the, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. Yes. Those who are ordained to believe. They will believe. They're not just going to go to heaven because right. they're, because they're they're chosen. They will trust Christ. Yes, and God will use means mm-hmm. to 
to bring all of his sheep unto himself. Okay, let's look at some verses. Let's look at some verses. Now, this is a fun part. We can, um, several different verses. So, I want you to, let's think of the idea of uh, God working through means. Uh, one classic example is in Acts chapter 16. It's one of those great verses you read in Acts, and you read over it, and you think, whoa, what a second, let me back up and reread that, because there is a hose, there's an ocean underneath that little puddle, or that little iceberg. There's a whole iceberg underneath what's jutting out of the water. Acts 16, 14 is one of those. Um, Acts 16, 14 is Paul preaching. Um, it's about Lydia. Verse, it says, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, so she believed. She heard Paul's preaching and believed. But that verse gives us a little insight into what's going on kind of behind the scenes, we might say, or in God's sovereign plan. The Lord opens her heart. Did Paul know where Olivia's heart was? No. Paul was preaching to whoever was there. But it says the Lord opens her heart to hear, to pay attention to the words that Paul spoke and implication the Lord regenerated her heart, opened her eyes, and she believed and became a, a leader in, in the church. So there's the means of Paul's preaching, the end of Lydia's conversion. So Lydia was one of those whom the Father gave to the Son before the foundation of the world. Paul didn't know that. Paul preaches the gospel. The Lord did his sovereign work. And she was saved. So there's just a classic proof text of the Lord working through means to accomplish his end. Okay, let's look at a few other verses. John 6, 37. This is a great example. There's actually two parts to John 6, 37, and I intentionally did not read the second half. So John 6, 37, and we're going to think of both these halves. Part A, all that the Father gives me, gives me, will come to me. Stop there. There is the Father gave the, the uh, Son of people. Second half. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. There is there's there's the, the free offer of the gospel. Uh, someone asked me, uh, you know, how do I know if I'm elect? Okay. Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. How do I know if I'm elect? Well, Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I don't know, Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. If you go to Jesus, then the Lord has done the sovereign work in your heart. Notice how Jesus just, uh, just states them. Um, he doesn't try to, you know, obviously Jesus is God in flesh, but there's no uh, attempt to, to philosophically reconcile those twin truths. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And with equal vigor, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. You see both sides uh, right there in that one verse, side by side in one sentence. Does everybody see that? Everybody, everybody got that? So we have sovereignty in part A of that verse. We have the free offer of the gospel. We can say that whoever, whoever comes to Jesus will never be cast out. We can say that to anyone. Jesus will receive whoever comes to Christ will be received by, by the Lord Jesus. That's the free offer of the gospel. Okay, let's look at a few more verses. Um, Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, uh, says that, uh, to summarize, says that the suffering servant was wounded for our transgressions, was bruised for our iniquities, our in context being God, his people, uh, the people for whom Jesus died on the cross. Jesus took our sins, his people's sins, on himself on the cross. By Jesus' stripes, his people are healed. Yet, a couple chapters later, we read in Isaiah 55, one of the great invitations in all of the Bible. Isaiah 55, 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money... Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Everyone who thirsts. Are you thirsty? Then go drink from the cup of Jesus. We don't have to qualify that. Only through elect. 
No, we don't know that. That's not up to God's mind. It's his purpose, his plan. We simply, all who are thirsty, go to Jesus, and you will find satisfaction for your heart and your soul. Um, so a few others. Matthew 11, this might be one of the best. Uh, Matthew 11, 25 through 30. Remember, this is Jesus. This isn't Calvin or John Owen. This is, this is Jesus. Um, Matthew 11, 25 to 30. Now, this, this is one paragraph uh, in Christ's teaching. So it says this. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you. Uh, here, it's, it's the context of Jesus is rebuking those cities where he had spent a lot of time, like Capernaum, uh, the cities in Galilee, where he just kind of camped out for a while, performed a lot of his miracles, and by and large, many of them have rejected him. So that's the kind of background context. At that time, verse 25, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things, these things being Jesus, who he was, his preaching, um, You've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them. Who's the one who hides and reveals? God. And that you have revealed these things to little children. Uh, yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. There's the key phrase. For such was your gracious will. For such was your good purpose. Why did God reveal to some and conceal to others? Again, this isn't Calvin. This is Jesus. For such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And note the next phrase. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Christ is sovereign in election. But... Look at the next verse. Again, one of the great invitations in all of Scripture. Come to me, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So I mean, just, I'll just let it sit. So you have some of the great statements of God's sovereignty, for such was your sovereign will. Um, uh, those that the Son chooses to reveal the Father. But that's that's big time sovereignty of God. Verse 28. Come to me, anyone who is weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that is the reason why our tradition, fourth tradition, and missionaries of the past will go and will, will die and risk their lives and will say to those who never heard of Jesus, go to the slums of, you know, of any town and city, um, to the addicts and, you know, and on and on, and will say, are you weary and heavy laden? Jesus says, come to me. And all who ever comes to me, I'll never cast you out. Does everybody see? And this is, this is two sentences, back to back. We've got both of these glorious truths. How do we reconcile it? We don't. We just rest in God's word. He uses means to accomplish his purposes. Um, J.I. Packer has a great book that if you want to dive into this a little more, um, called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, one of the classic books on evangelism. Um, Jack Packer says, Evangelism is man's work, but the giving of faith is God's work. So we're called to sow the seed. God is the one who opens the heart like he did with Lydia. Um, a couple other verses. Um, uh, Romans 9. I just want to read the chapters. Romans 9. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So it was not of man or him who wills, but of God to show mercy. All that's Romans 9 in the kind of classic proof text of election. What's the very next chapter about in Romans 10? And then what's Romans 10 about? How shall they hear unless someone preaches to them? How will someone preach unless they are sent? How beautiful of the sea is those who preach the good news. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So Romans, Paul has no trouble in asserting God's sovereignty and grace. In Romans 9, I mean, that's one of the clearest statements, if not the clearest 
in all the Bible, he doesn't give some kind of big qualifier. He just goes to the very next chapter. How are they going to hear unless they're sent, unless, unless someone preaches to them? Again, Romans 9, the same Paul that wrote Romans 9 under the inspiration of the Spirit is the Paul that wrote Romans 10 under the inspiration of the Spirit. God uses the means of his word, preaching and evangelizing and sharing the gospel to bring his sheep to himself. Um, a couple others, and then we'll move on to point number uh, four. Uh, look at, uh, well, remember Ephesians 1, uh, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Jesus holds people responsible who reject him. Um, we are all responsible moral agents to heed the call to repent and turn to Christ. Paul says in Acts 17.30, God commands all men everywhere to repent. That is a universal command to repent and to believe the gospel. Um, John chapter 5, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for their hard-heartedness. And notice, Jesus doesn't put the blame on God. You know, that would be her heresy. It would be sin. But Jesus, um, the, the Pharisees, they are the ones who are guilty and culpable for refusing in the hardness of their hearts to repent and believe. John chapter 5, verse 40. Now again, Jesus, the context is rebuking the Pharisees, and Jesus says, Yet you, you religious leaders, refuse to come to me that you may have life. Other translations might say, Yet you would not come to me that you would have eternal life. You refuse of your own volition, you hard-hearted Pharisee. You refused the call to repent and believe and come to me. Uh, the, the responsibility is with, with man. We are responsible moral creatures. We, throughout the Bible, we are responsible for the actions uh, that, we, that we make. At the same time, we hold God's sovereignty. Again, there's a, there's a, a balance there that we want to hold together. Uh, so some might ask, you know, how do we reconcile um, election and evangelism. And my husband Spurgeon, I'm not, not, not sure, said, we don't need to. Only enemies need to be reconciled and not friends. So election and evangelism, they're friends. They, they, they sweetly comply. Um, so we, we want to hold both truths precious and, and dear. We've reached our fourth point, and we'll, we'll stop with number four. Um, we have got some thoughts and discussion if we have time. Fourth point is actually, let's, let's kind of flip the question on its head. Not that we need to be on the defensive, but actually, why could we assert or state that holding to God's sovereignty actually compels us to evangelism? It shouldn't be seen as a hindrance, but it actually, if properly understood, should be seen as a, a motive. Uh, that should impel and compel us, as it has done for the last 500 years in the history of the Reformation, they were moved, our forefathers, compelled to evangelism. And these, you know, they, they, and they did the ones that kind of articulated uh, this great um, Calvinist system that we, we hold dear. Why? What are some reasons why it should actually compel us to evangelism? Yes, uh, Grant? Because we know that God has sovereignly made it so that the harvest is plentiful, right? That's a that's a promise from God that people will believe because that, you know, that work of the giving of faith is done by him. So we don't have to wonder if we can be convincing enough or argue people into exactly. faith because we can't. Yeah, I mean, it is a great burden to think, you know, I think I answered that wrong. Therefore, it's my fault, you know, that they, you know, I might get one shot with them. And I, I didn't remember that this was that verse, or gosh, you know, it was all on me. No. I mean, yeah, we're supposed to study and be responsible, and we should know the gospel and be able to share it. But, as Grant said, the harvest is plentiful. Is it plentiful now? Well, that was written 2,000 years ago. Maybe it's not still plentiful. There's still people being born. There's still people still who haven't heard the gospel. Right? It's yeah. still plentiful. <laughs> uh, the, the fields are white for harvest. They're as white today as they were 2,000 years ago. Um, and God is sending the laborers 
uh, out into the harvest. And so we have got promise that the fields are plentiful, uh, they're ripe for harvest, and we can go with confidence that God's people will, in his timing, come. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the Lord's not going to return with every single last sheep, every last one that he gave to his son uh, is in time saved and, and redeemed. So we, we can have confidence to go. God has his sheep everywhere. Remember Jesus said, I have other sheep, not of this fold. One of the verse, sorry, I just popped into my head because we forgot about it. Uh, Acts 18. Acts 18, this is exactly what kind of Grant was getting at. Paul's in Corinth, and uh, where is it? It says, um, okay, so uh, look at verse 10 and 9 to 10. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, that Paul was facing some challenges in Corinth, um, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Paul was wondering, you know, Corinth was a pretty rough place. Um, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. I think the right way to read that is, I have many that haven't heard you yet, who are not my people. It doesn't say, Paul says, okay, I can pack my bags and go, so no, they're elect, I can get out of here. Go to the next place. No. Paul says, and Paul stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God. So, you know, Paul was in a you know, unique place in redemptive history, so the Lord told him, stay here, I have more people here. Um, therefore, Paul stayed and preached. The same is true. God has his people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Therefore, until he returns, we are tasked with sharing the gospel. So yeah, any other reasons? Uh, Grant kind of nailed the biggest one. That God has his people, um, and we they will hear. His people will hear and will um, respond. What if God wasn't sovereign in an election? What would our the odds be of someone actually repenting and believing if God wasn't sovereign in an election? Zero. <laughs> Because man is dead in sin, right? And so we rest in God's sovereign work. Um, the man is dead, dead in sin, um, and we know that God will regenerate His people. It's not up to us. Um, we don't have to kind of talk Him into the kingdom, uh, so to speak. We know that God uses means to bring His people, to bring His people home. Uh, you get the drift. Uh, those are the reasons why why the reformers and those who followed in their footsteps. Um, who have held to a high view of God's sovereignty have been the most zealous, with a few exceptions of the hyper Calvinists, and we're not them. Um, we're the most zealous in missionary labor. William Carey, Adoniram Judson, Hudson Taylor, um, John Patton, uh, Jim Elliott, uh, more and more and more all fervently held to um, God's sovereignty. And they were passionate missionaries and evangelists. Okay, I'm done. I'll stop there. Um, Spurgeon, actually, I have one more thing. Sorry. <laughs> Spurgeon said, Spurgeon has a, has a little, I think it was Spurgeon, who said, um, you know, imagine, imagine someone repents and believes. They walk into the door of the church. Maybe you might have heard this analogy illustration. Um, on the outside of the church, it says, whosoever wills, let him come. On the inside of the church, it says, elect for the, before the foundation of the world. So we are, our responsibility is whosoever will may come. Um, the Lord and his sovereign purpose will bring his sheep home. So, okay, any questions or thoughts? We have about a minute or two. Um, so we want to hold these as friends. Yeah, Angela? Um, one thing that kept coming to mind while you were talking was the verse in 1 Corinthians that says, I planted the seed and Apollo watered yes, it, very good. God made it grow. Yes, <coughs> you, that's good. Yeah, so it's 1 Corinthians 3 and 4 where it says, Paul says, I plant to the polished water, but God gives the increase. So it's not of him who plants or him who um, uh, sows or him who plants, but of God who gives the increase. And so we, some plant, some, uh, some sow, some plant, but God uh, gives the increase. Some, their task is to just kind of pound up hard soil. And we'll see zero conversions. William Carey, William Carey, um, it was years in India before we saw any kind of fruit or any conversion. Um, some break the hard soil, and those that follow them, you know, they sow the seed, and, and the soil is unprepared. Um, 
that God is the one who gives the increase. Yeah, very good. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay, we'll, we'll move on to Mark. Justin, do you have a thought? You, you look... You I, so, I, I guess this, this is one of the things that uh, kind of hits me is, um, like, I mean, Paul says in Acts 20, 24, like, yeah. my, I, don't count, I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, only that it may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel and the grace of God. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. he pretty much says, I mean, if, if many of them died, yeah, but then and today, I mean, it's it's kind of, I don't know, very black and white to me. Yeah. It's like, what else can we do? What else is there? Right, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Yeah, I mean, we, we, Paul considered his life uh, of nothing that others might hear the gospel. So look at church. You know, we'll talk about, you know, you know ways and kind of um, um, how we can befriend folks that we come across and, uh, and the relationships we have. That's all going to come. Um, but right now, we're just laying this foundation. And we can stop here. Um, and we've, we've got enough just to, to be motivated to go share the gospel. Observer will, you know, will come. So we'll close there. Let's close this there. Grant, would you close this there? Absolutely, yeah. Father God, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for um, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross where he paid for our sins and rose again for our justification. Um, I pray that you would uh, empower us to go take this message to the unbelievers who are here even in our own city. Um, please help us all to be salt and light in the world and to represent you and to um, just spread the message of the gospel. Amen. Thank you. Well, have a good afternoon, everybody.